This is Indiana Weekend, some of the most interesting people and places from around our region. These are the stories you won't always see on the regular news, voices you won't always hear elsewhere. I'm John Strauss. This is a kind of news magazine show with stories just a bit off the beaten path. Today, the White River, a place of recreation and preservation. Muncie has an approved uh, long-term control plan. And that's why you see this construction going on all over town of, of major sewers. What's happening is, is that uh, uh, sewers are being separated so that CSOs are being eliminated. But we open today on a somewhat darker note, the grim world of film noir, of movies like Maltese Falcon, DOA, Touch of Evil, and detour. That's the greatest cock and bull story I ever heard. So he fell out of his car. Say, who do you think you're talking to, a hick? Listen, mister, I've been around, and I know a wrong guy when I see one. What'd you do, kiss him with a wrench? Now, wait a, minute. a Ball State University online course on film noir just ended in August. More than 16,000 people signed up. This was a partnership with Turner Classic Movies, and the course was called TCM presents Into the Darkness, Investigating Film Noir. The class was developed by Richard Edwards, Executive Director of Ball State's iLearn Research. Film noir is something that's very difficult to define. Um, for the last 70 years, scholars and fans have been trying to come up with a definition of what film noir is, and we're probably no closer today than we were 70 years ago. The old crow downstairs said there's a folding bed behind this door. You know how to work it? I invented it. Overall, what I tend to think of when someone asks me to find film noir is that there were a certain number of films that started to be made in the early 1940s that felt very different from other detective and crime thrillers that had been made in the 1930s. These films seemed to have a grittier substance. They seemed to have a more excessive style. They seemed to be telling a, this crime story in new and different ways. And what happens is there are all these films being made during World War II, mostly around the crime thriller, films like The Maltese Falcon, Laura, Double Indemnity, and critics in the U.S. are starting to pick up on that something is happening in Hollywood. But it's not until 1946 in France that a couple film critics, Nino Franck and Jean-Paul Cartier, are actually seeing these films all at once. During World War II, these films were, Hollywood films were embargoed in France. And so critics like Franck and Chartier were able to see hundreds of films in a very compressed time period, and they were able to start to see how these films, like The Maltese Falcon and Double Indemnity, were different. At the same time, they, there was also, it was very popular in France that they were translating the hard-boiled novels of Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett, and they were calling these books, when they were translated into French, Série Noire, um, the noir series of hard-boiled literature. And when Nino Franck was looking for a term to talk about these new dark and bleak crime thrillers, he coined the term film noir. It's an American film style with a very French name. There's disagreement over the first movie to really use this style, but a great early example is 1941's Maltese Falcon, directed by John Huston, starring Humphrey Bogart as Private Eye Sam Spade. It has really those core elements that we begin to associate with film noir. It's the hard-boiled detective going as a kind of tarnished knight, going into a more corrupt world, neither wholly bad nor wholly good, at the heart of this mystery that is being propelled by fate. And um, at the heart of the Maltese Falcon, we have one of our great, um, you know, uh, adventures of all time as characters like Sidney Greenstreet and Peter Lorre, along with uh, Humphrey Bogart and Mary Astor, are all chasing you know, the iconic Maltese Falcon, which is this literal um, object that the stuff that dreams are made of. That's a good place to start. And to see another example, as the film noir style evolved, you can check out 1944's Double Indemnity, 
directed by Billy Wilder and starring Fred McMurray and Barbara Stanwyck. This is a film that has it all. It's written by Billy Wilder and Raymond Chandler. Uh, it is um, really one of these stories that has a genuine femme fatale, this dangerous woman that's going to upset the balance of power in the film. It's the story of an insurance agent who goes on a sales call one day and falls in love with his client's wife. They then plot to kill her husband. Like some of the best of these tense crime dramas, the story is told through flashbacks. These are stories that frequently start at the end. They start with the character having literally lost everything, and then the story is the retelling of how they got to that point. And Double Indemnity is just so great at that because you have Fred McMurray literally telling his dark tale into a dictaphone, and we in the audience are along for the ride and what a tremendous ride it is. It's one of the reasons why I'm teaching this course on film noir is to really recognize just how many amazing elements of cinematic storytelling were really advanced and innovated in the film noir style and genre. But, you know, alongside films like Double Indemnity, you have films like Murder My Sweet that literally start with a blinded Dick Powell playing uh, the character of Philip Marlowe, retelling his story in flashback. So this is a fairly consistent plot device. These hard-edged movies ended up influencing cinema in many ways, from the use of tough characters and vivid dialogue to a shooting style that includes a heavy use of shadows, night filming, and low-angle shots. Part of what is so interesting when you're talking about noir is the first thing that tends to grab audiences is the style. I mean, there's no doubt that in the classic Hollywood period of the 1940s and 50s, the films of film noir are some of the most gorgeous films made in black and white. These were films that used deep focus photography, that used shadows that were more than night, that used night for night shooting to create just this real overwhelming mood and atmosphere that just is amazing to look at. They had amazing sound designs, especially uh, related to the role of jazz music. They had editing that really advanced our ability to tell these stories that used flashback and complicated narratives. They had amazing costume design. These were worlds in which the characters were constantly in motion and the mise-en-scene itself was animated with cigarette smoke, with, you know, tough talk and, um, you know, amazing faces. A movie often cited is Orson Welles' Touch of Evil from 1958 which Richard regards as one of the last examples of the classic noir period. People remember this from the long tracking shot at the beginning and an appearance by Charlton Heston as a Mexican police chief. Touch of Evil famously opens with a three and a half minute single edit tracking shot uh, in a U.S.-Mexico border town that is just absolutely a masterwork of cinematic technique. He pushes everything in that film to its logical extreme. The heavies are heavier than in other films. The corruption runs deeper and is more systemic. The resolution is even more impossible to ever recognize that any good might be able to come out of the type of universe that's being concocted on screen. And a lot of people then feel that after a film like Touch of Evil, there's not really that much farther for filmmakers to take the cycle. And then, as I said, I really think it was at that point that the baton of film noir was really handed over to the European filmmakers. And filmmakers such as Godard and Truffaut and Melville were really inspired by a film like Touch of Evil. And you can see elements of that film in many great French films between 1959 and 1963. Another reason there were so many of these films, they often did not cost that much to make. And the movie Detour is a good example. Style can come on the cheap. If you're really, if you don't have great sets, if you don't have a great script, if you don't have a lot of budget, well, it's not that expensive to make shadows. It's not that expensive to shoot at night. It's not that expensive to play tricks with the camera. And so 
Edgar Ulmer, the di director of Detour, is very famous and sometimes is referred to as the king of the B films because a film like Detour was shot in just a couple of weeks on a very small budget. It probably, in all reality, had one eighth of the budget of a film like Double Indemnity. So he shot it fast and he shot it cheap. Uh, but oh boy, over its 67 minute running length, it's a masterpiece. It shows how much you can do if you are a storyteller. It's not about the money, it's about the story you got to tell. And some of these films, like Detour, DOA, and The Hitchhiker, are in the public domain, meaning you can easily find them online at a site like archive.org. And you can watch just how a talented filmmaker like Edgar Ulmer used his talent to craft a masterpiece out of um, very small budget. Um, the critic Jay Hoberman has my favorite line about Detour. He says, Watching Detour is like finding a Rembrandt wadded up on a uh, roll of bubblegum. Um, and that's what it is. I mean, it's like you, you start to recognize that while there might be more technically proficient films, that there might be films that might have um, some of the A-list actors that we find synonymous with noir. When you watch the performances of Tom Neal and Ann Savage in Detour, you know you're just in the very bleakest heart of noir. But I still don't understand all this. You will in a minute. I almost threw away a gold mine. 1850 isn't to be sneezed at. Style isn't the only reason this genre has remained popular for more than 70 years. These filmmakers were talking to an audience that was jaded in some way and ready for a view of life different from what Hollywood had offered before. These were stories that were told at a time when America was very anxious. We had just come out of World War II. We were entering into the Cold War, the communist witch hunts, and the paranoia of the 1950s, along with the rise of corporate and consumer culture. These were anxious times in America, and these were stories that we were telling ourselves almost as myths to help us understand these radical shifts and disruptions and dislocations that were happening in everyday life. And I think we can go back and look at these because these are not the romantic happy endings of the Hollywood era. These are films that were much more realistic, much closer to the ordinary feelings of discomfort and anxiety that ordinary Americans were feeling. And I think when we watch these films today, we start to see certain parallels with how we feel about culture today. And sure enough, he and others are seeing a renewed interest in these kinds of movies. Noir is um, something that's never gone out of vogue over the last 70 years. Part of what I think is so fascinating about film noir is even when we struggle to define it, it's the type of film that really, if you turned it on TV today, you would know it if you saw it. There's very few people who can watch films like Out of the Past, The Killers, DOA, Kiss Me Deadly, Touch of Evil, and go, boy, I, those look like westerns or musicals to me. I mean, we know they're films noir, but what was so amazing is these films were so powerful, they then led European filmmakers in the early 60s, especially in the French New Wave, to make their type of hard-boiled crime thriller, films like Jean, uh, Jean-Luc Godard's Breathless or Francois Truffaut's Shoot the Piano Player. Those films then influenced the young film school generation in the late 60s. So filmmakers like Martin Scorsese are, make films like Mean Streets and Taxi Driver that really are part of this lineage of film noir. A resurgence in the 1980s brought us films like Body Heat, directed by Lawrence Kasdan, starring William Hurt as a small-town lawyer and Kathleen Turner as the femme fatale, and Blade Runner by Ridley Scott, starring Harrison Ford. One of the areas where a lot of people I think today are familiar with the noir aesthetic are in a subgenre that I would call sci science fiction noir. And you have films like uh, Blade Runner, Dark City, in which you have these universes that are clearly science fiction universes versus the film noir universe is actually the, usually the urban jungle of mid 40s and mid 50s America. But they take that style, they like the bleak, nihilistic worldview, so they want that in the science fiction film as well. 
and then they run with it. And it's exciting. In a film like Blade Runner, which I think is a very strong example of how film noir can be reconsidered in light of science fiction elements, you get a masterful film that is a blend of two very different genres, the crime thriller and the science fiction fantasy. Um, and what glues it together is both the soulfulness of the noir story, that there has to be some human element, there has to be some ultimate meditation on loss, decay, despair at the heart of Blade Runner. Otherwise, it would just be style in the service of no substance. Our national anxiety after 9-11 may have triggered another wave in interest in dark storytelling. So you get films like Christopher Nolan's uh, Batman trilogy, or you get films like Robert Rodriguez's Sin City films as yet another element of where noir never really dies. It just keeps coming back in different and more innovative forms. I want to report a murder. Sit down. Where was this murder committed? San Francisco, last night. Who was murdered? I was. Thankfully, movies aren't the only way to cope with the stress of modern life. For some folks, a trip to the river works even better. People don't know what White River and what they're missing until they get out here. This is the best kept secret that this county has. Guys that are executive chefs for big name people that this is what they come to do and he just says it's, this just is stress relief. In the closing weeks of the season, you tend to grab for every last scrap of summer you can get. Recently, a fellow on Facebook put together an inner tubing trip on White River, and 500 people signed up. We don't know exactly how many folks showed up at the starting point near Yorktown, but it was a lot. White River may be one of the state's least recognized recreational resources. We talked with Robbie Mikesell, owner of Canoe Country in Daleville recently, on a beautiful day with long shadows under the trees. He talked about the reaction people have when they get out on the water. They really enjoy this river because of how scenic it is and how peaceful and how secluded that the river is. I mean, there's not a lot of development along the water, so you don't get a lot of traffic and which which is nice because you don't you don't hear the people you don't hear the traffic you don't hear that city noise you're able to get out and enjoy nature if the river is a place of peace and beauty now well it wasn't always that way john craddock is director emeritus of the muncie bureau of water quality in fact he started the city's water pollution control agency in 1972 after working on pollution issues while a student at ball state he remembers what the river was like in the late 1960s and early 70s and showed us photos he's taken over the years. This is when it was red and green, orange, blue, every color, the rainbow that one could think of, uh, uh, except you don't want it that color. Uh, this was also the same period of time that across the United States, it wasn't just Muncie, Indiana. It wasn't just the White River. This is during the same period of time that like the Cuyahoga River uh, in Ohio was burning and catching fire. Uh, don't forget that EPA came into existence in 1970. The reason that it came into existence was because we as a society had not done environmentally what we should be doing. So our White River was pretty typical as the rivers across the United States. It was highly polluted, it was full of industrial waste, raw sewage, it was weedy, it was overgrown, it smelled, there were tires, refrigerators, bicycles, uh, we drove over it and went to work as a society. We ignored it, we turned our backs on it, and uh, it was not used recreationally uh, uh, for hardly anything. White River was hardly alone. A lot of the damage here and elsewhere occurred before people thought much about protecting the environment. The first Earth Day observance wasn't until 1970, and the Environmental Protection Agency was started later that year. Early on, the effects of chrome, cadmium, pesticides, and other chemicals in the water were not well understood. Some of them we couldn't even hardly test for and detect, let alone have any long-term studies knowing about anything from birth defects to potential cancer-producing uh, agents. 
These were studies that came along later. So a lot of the disposal methods that were taking place in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s in particular, I believe were done out of, out of ignorance. That doesn't make it right, but for the most part, my feeling is, is that, that that was pretty much it. We didn't realize that if we, if we dumped this on the ground behind our particular facility, uh, that it could end up in our groundwater system. He could see something was wrong even without sophisticated tests. I think the first time I saw it uh, extremely green, extremely orange, and then the first major oil spill that we had. And also fish kills, our first major fish kill that we had. Uh, the first uh, from about 1970 to 1985 we had 10 fish kills in Muncie. The last one was around 65,000 fish. As bad as it looked, there was still pushback against protecting the rivers. But in Muncie, the emphasis was on cooperation. Craddock had just started what became the Muncie Bureau of Water Quality. We could levy a $1,000 a day fine, administrative fine, from my desk for each parameter that was out of limits. So if an industry in town was over for chrome, copper, and zinc, that's a $3,000 a day fine or a $90,000 a month fine. Our philosophy was to go in the door, work with the industry, have the equipment put in that's called pretreatment equipment to treat that toxic waste on site. The money sitting in the bank does not clean up the problem. If you're in the middle of a court case, the discharge is still going while the court case is going. So we took a little different attitude. We want the clean water without loss of jobs. In 31 years, I only had to issue one $1,000 fine. So it did work. Yet the industrial community invested over $20 million. It took time to see results because the river was so polluted. We realized that it was so heavily polluted that it was like peeling back layers of an onion, if you will. And we had to get so many layers peeled back before we would actually see the change. And I remember one year, all of a sudden, and I, I, it must have been late 70s in there somewhere, uh, to where all of a sudden we sar started to see the increase in aquatic insects. We found our first freshwater mussels that weren't there when we came and hadn't been there maybe for 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, we started to see a change in the aquatic insects to where we would only find tubiflex worms and those uh, organisms that are found in highly polluted water. We started to find stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies that are clean water species. To where now you're up to the point to where we went from 30 species of fish to up to 65 species of fish now, more than doubled them. The bottom two feet of the river when we started was sewage, sludge, and industrial muck. When you stepped in it with your waders, there was a and a black ooze would come out. Now it's sand, gravel, or bedrock. Here's how it looks today, a river that's an attraction for fishing and recreation. I had people that came from northern Indiana that went on the Mongo River. Um, they go up there all the time. They're from Fort Wayne area. Uh, they came down here a couple weeks ago because they were closed due to flooding. Um, these ladies said, your river is just so much nicer, it's so much cleaner, um, a lot more trees and secluded and just a lot more rapids and a lot more twisting and turning to make it more, more fun and more adventurous than just, you know, paddling on a flat water or something that's more of a still running water. Even when the water's down and the current is slow, there's still something about the river that draws people here. It's just such a calming effect. I mean, just to be out on the water, to be out in nature, it's just stress and everyday worries, just, they just melt away. We have a bald eagle living along the section of the river um, and people see it usually on a daily basis, if not sometimes different but you know it flies up and down this section of the river all the time that where people see it and this is the first time that I can ever remember um, seeing a bald eagle and it hangs around here quite frequently and we see it quite a lot. More needs to be done 
especially controlling CSOs, the combination sewer overflows that routinely dump raw sewage into White River. Plans call for spending more than $100 million on that effort in the Muncie area. Craddock says it may take another 20 years to really clean the river. Right now, I don't know, on a grading scale in 1970, I would have given the White River an F or an F minus if there's such a possibility. I would give the White River in Muncie right now most times a B. To get up to an A or an A plus, like many things in life, that first 40 years versus the next 20, the next 20 is probably going to cost as much or more than the last 40. To finish the cleanup, what Craddock calls the last five percentage points of cleanliness will be expensive. Then the question becomes, are we willing to pay for that? How much, we'll have to decide, is a really clean river worth? That's our show for today. Thanks for being part of it with us. Hope you'll join us next time as we find more stories off the beaten path from across the state on Indiana Weekend.